Yummy food. I'm going to be reading from Jeremiah 11, 1 to 17. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Listen to the terms of this covenant and tell them to the people of Judah and those who live in Jerusalem. Tell them that this is what the Lord, the, the God of Israel says. Cursed is the one who does not obey the terms of this covenant. The terms I commanded your ancestors when I brought them out of Egypt, out of the iron smelting furnace. I said, obey me and do everything I command you and you and you will be my people and I will be your God. Then I will fulfill the oath I swore to your ancestors to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, the land you poses today. I answered, Amen, Lord. The Lord said to me, Proclaim all these words in the towns of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Listen to the terms of this covenant and follow them from the time I brought your ancestors up from Egypt until today. I warned them again and again, saying, Obey me. But they did not listen or pay attention. Instead, they followed the stubbornness of their evil hearts. So I brought on all the curses of the covenant I had commanded them to follow, but that did not keep. Then the Lord said to me, There is a conspiracy among the people of Judah and those who live in Jerusalem. They have returned to the sin of their ancestors, who refused to listen to my words. They have followed other gods to serve them. Both Israel and Judah have broken the covenant I have made with their ancestors. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I will bring on them a disaster they cannot escape. Although they cry out to me, I will not listen to them. The town of Judah and the people of Jerusalem will go and cry out to the gods whom they burn incense, but they will not help them at all when disaster strikes. You, Judah, have as many gods as you have towns, and the altars you have set up to burn incense to that shameful god Baal are as many as the streets of Jerusalem. Do not pray for this people or offer any plea or petition for them because I will not listen when they call me to in the time of their distress. What is my beloved doing in my temple? As she, with many other works, out her evil schemes, can consecrated meat avert your punishment? When you engage in your wickedness, then you rejoice. The Lord called you a thriving olive tree with fruit in form, but with the roar of a mighty storm, he will set it on fire and its branches will be broken. The Lord Almighty who planted you has decreed disaster for you because the people of both Israel and Judah have done evil and aroused my anger by burning incense to Baal. During COVID, there's one thing we've had to get a lot more better at is, and that is contracts. Have you found yourself going over contracts lately? My wife, Jen and I are celebrating our 25 year anniversary in October and uh, we were going to leave the kids with the grandparents and go away somewhere nice. I don't remember exactly where Jen booked, but in my mind, it was something like this. Unfortunately, COVID has ruled that out. So we've had to look closely at the contract. What is the cancellation policy? Can we get our money back? Can I still get the free hotel slippers and the little plastic bag that I can walk around in? That's what I want to know. But all of us are doing similar things, you know, with flights and with renovations and kids sports that we've arranged and so on. We've all become contract experts. 
In Jeremiah this week, we come to a contract problem. There's an issue with the contract, or should I say a covenant problem. A covenant's like a contract, only it's more about the relationship itself. God and his people had committed to each other in a formal relationship. They'd set it down in writing, but now there's been a breach in the covenant. Something's gone wrong, and there are consequences to work out. Of course, this passage then raises questions about us and our relationship with God. Are we in a covenant too? What is our arrangement? What are the details? Well, so far in this series, in Jeremiah, we've met the young prophet himself. Uh, He's a youth or a teenager from a family of priests who's been given the job of demolishing the kingdom of Judah with the word of God. It's a demolition job of tearing down a nation. Now, the nation's committed spiritual adultery, that's chapters 2 to 4. They've committed false worship, that's chapters 7 to 10. And in between, chapters 5 and 6, that's about God uh, being described as a warrior laying siege to the city. That's what's been happening. But in 11 verse 1, the word of the Lord comes again to Jeremiah, and this starts a new section. And we have, in the next two chapters, three problems for God and Jeremiah. And that is that the covenant is broken, there is trouble in the family, And God is taking too long. The first problem is in 11 verse 1 to 17. And that is that the people of Judah have broken the covenant. Now that was read to us before, but the verdict is very clear in verse 10. Verse 10 says, They have returned to the sins of their ancestors who refused to listen to my words. They have followed other gods to serve them. Both Israel and Judah have broken the covenant I made with their ancestors. Now, let's backtrack a little bit here. What's the covenant that Jeremiah is talking about? Well, about a thousand years before, God had written down a covenant with the people of Israel at Mount Sinai in the desert. Now, a covenant, it's a formalized relationship between two parties with commitments to each other and consequences for breaking it. And this covenant is uh, recorded in the book of Deuteronomy, Exodus and Deuteronomy, but it's a good summary here in Deuteronomy 29, verse 12 to 15. Moses says to the people, You are standing here in order to enter into a covenant with the Lord your God. A covenant the Lord is making with you this day and sealing with an oath to confirm you this day as his people, that he may be your God as he promised you and as he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I am making this covenant with its oath and not only with you who are standing here with us today in the presence of the Lord our God, but also with those who are not here today. See, this is the covenant The Lord will be their God. They will be his people. And the commitments are written down. God will give the people the land and provide for them and protect them. And the people will be exclusively loyal to the Lord and obey his commands written in the law of God. And we see these terms uh, in the passage in Jeremiah, especially verses 3 to 5. God says to Jeremiah, Tell them that this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Cursed is the one who does not obey the terms of this covenant. The terms I commanded your ancestors when I brought them out of Egypt, out of the iron smelting furnace. I said, obey me and do everything I command you and you will be my people and I will be your God. Then I will fulfill the oath I swore to your ancestors to give them a land flowing with milk and honey, the land you possess today. See, everyone knows the terms. It's very clear. However, Judah has broken the covenant. They have worshipped other gods. They have disobeyed the commands. But what really is at the heart of the problem is not just rule breaking. It's actually the problem of their hearts. In verse 8, But they did not listen or pay attention. Instead, they followed the stubbornness of their evil hearts. Behind all their rule breaking was an internal problem, stubborn and evil hearts. Now, the same problem exists for us today. Now, we might not have the same contract, the same covenant arrangement as the Jewish people did in 500 BC, but we've got the same problem, stubborn and sinful hearts. Jesus said, for it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. The nicest person you know, the most famous, really good person we've heard of, fundamentally has at the core of them a stubborn and evil heart. You and I are not basically good people. We're basically evil people. 
Now, if you're investigating Christianity, this idea can be pretty confronting, this sinful and stubborn heart. Our problem with God is, is not that there's a lack of evidence for Christianity. It's not that we're not religious. It's not that life is too busy. Our problem is our stubborn and evil hearts. I reckon for a lot of people, this lockdown has shown the evil in our hearts. There's nothing like being stuck at home with online school and lots of screen time to bring it out. Anger, bitterness, drunkenness, lust, take your pick. In lockdown, every sin wins a prize. But for Israel, this covenant issue, it really shouldn't have come as a big surprise. Because God has warned them repeatedly, according to verse 7. He's just shown so much patience. Verse 7, from the time I brought your ancestors up from Egypt until today, I warned them again and again, saying, obey me. He has sent them prophets of all kinds for every opportunity to change. So many warnings. In soccer, the referee has the ability to warn rule breakers with a yellow card. Players get one yellow card as a warning, and if they do the wrong thing again, they get a red card and they are sent off. In 2006, when Australia played Croatia in the World Cup, at the 61st minute, Croatian defender Josef Simonic picked up his first yellow from English referee Graham Pohl. Then at the 90th minute, the ref gave him a second, but not the red. And then at the 93rd minute, after the game was over, he picked up a third and was finally shown the red. The player got one extra warning. Well, God has been showing his people not one or two yellow cards, but dozens of yellow cards over the centuries. But they have still not taken the warning. Now the red card is coming. Covenant breakage has triggered serious covenant consequences. Have a look in verse 11. Therefore, this is what the Lord says, I will bring on them a disaster they cannot escape. A disaster is coming. And the certainty of this disaster is made clear with four things from verses 11 to 15. Four things. Firstly, God will not listen. That's in verse 11. The time is over for when people can cry out for help. Secondly, their gods won't help them in verse 12. Those false gods that they worshipped won't help them now. Thirdly, Jeremiah won't pray for them in verse 14. Like Jeremiah had presumably been praying for his people during this time, but that's all over now. Time is up for prayer. And fourthly, their sacrifices won't work in verse 15. Religious activities and offerings and bargainings, that will not work. It is too late for that. It's a frightening series of verses. And it reminds us too, I think, that there will come a time for us in our city and all of humanity when it is too late to repent and turn back to God. The yellow will turn to red. Up until that time, we can pray for our friends and family. We can plead with them to come back to God. We can turn back ourselves. But eventually, time will run out. The opportunity for prayer will be over and death or the day of judgment will come. And nobody knows when that will be. For the 2022 Winter Olympics in Beijing, there's a big timer in the city. It's counting down the days, hours, minutes and seconds. Everyone knows when the games will begin. And there's something like that in God's plan for the day of judgment. Only we can't see the numbers. So if you're considering whether to turn back to God, don't take the risk that time will run out before you do. Turn back now before it's too late. Well, we've looked at the first problem. Israel has broken the covenant. Very serious problem indeed. But the second problem comes through in the second part of chapter 12, 11, sorry. The second problem is that Jeremiah is in trouble with his family for talking about God. Just have a look in verses 18 to 21. Because the Lord revealed their plot to me, I knew it. For at that time, he showed me what they were doing. I had been like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I did not realize that they had plotted against me, saying, Let us destroy the tree and its fruit. Let us cut him off from the land of the living, that his name be remembered no more. But you, Lord Almighty, who judge righteously and test the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance on them, for to you I have committed my cause. 
Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the people of Anathoth who are threatening to kill you, saying, do not prophesy in the name of the Lord or you will die by your hands. Now, can you see what's happening? Anathoth was Jeremiah's hometown, according to chapter one. We learned that, Anathoth. And the people there want Jeremiah dead. They say, do not prophesy in the name of the Lord or you will die by our hands. This is a family issue. Do you remember in chapter one, it was forecast that Jeremiah would be in for a rough time. People will oppose him. Sure enough, now that he's talking to people about God and sin and judgment, they want him silent, even his own family. He's facing an early version of cancel culture. Only here, it's not his Facebook account they want to terminate, it's his life itself. Now, there's three things to say about, I think, this uh, situation of Jeremiah's. Uh, first, once again, we see Jeremiah here setting a pattern that Jesus will follow. Just like Jeremiah, Jesus had people plot his death because uh, they didn't like what he was saying and doing. Even in his own hometown, people wanted him dead. Now, of course, in uh, Jesus' case, it actually happened. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, to use Jeremiah's words. He, he committed his cause to God and he died as a faithful prophet in Jerusalem. So Jeremiah is pointing forward to Jesus here. But secondly, this reminds us that the message of the gospel, the message about God is still generally unwelcome today. When we speak about Jesus, the world will try to shut us down. Just recently, the Australian Christian lobby booked a venue in Western Australia for a conference, but the owners of the venue, the state government, suddenly canceled the booking just a few weeks out. Not because of COVID, not because the ACL hadn't paid, but because they were Christians. It was only after some serious protests that they were actually able to pay for and use the venue. That's one reason it's so good that we're securing our own venue at Garden Suburb. It gives us a location from which we can proclaim the gospel without the threat of eviction. But more importantly than that, it's just, this passage shows us we need to have the courage of Jeremiah to, speak, to keep speaking about God in a world that doesn't want to hear. And then thirdly, this little section I think shows us that we can't always please our family. Jeremiah's family in Anathoth weren't happy with him. And in 12 verse six, God speaks about this again, actually in 12 verse six, your relatives, members of your own family, even they have betrayed you. They have raised a loud cry against you. Do not trust them, though they speak well of you. And of course, Jesus warned us about this as well in Luke chapter 12. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two and two against three. They will be divided, father against son and son against mother, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. Now, I hope that you have a great relationship with your family. And of course, we always must honor our father and mother, according to the fifth commandment. But for Christians, we can't always please our family. As much as we love them, our first loyalty is to God. And we will still gently speak the truth about Jesus and the truth about sin, judgment and grace. And we will live lives that seek to please God. Now, many of us, although we love Jesus, I think are also hanging on to something else that's very precious to us, which we, we could call parental approval. Kind of like a trophy on your bookshelf. I've got this old trophy of mine that uh, was in a box under the house. We've got a close up of the uh, plaque. It's uh, NCC, that's Norman Hurst Cricket Club, 1985-86, best bowler, under 11 black, R. Sweatman. That's me. <laughs> Best bowler. I know you're impressed. What a great trophy this is. You could ask your dads for Father's Day if they've got something like it under their house. I bet they do. But some of us have a virtual trophy labeled parental approval. So like whatever else is happening in life, you've got the trophy, parental approval. And, and following Jesus has a big impact on your life, but this trophy eventually always takes top priority. I think this is something you've got to give over to Jesus. 
especially uh, perhaps uh, youth guys, your guys in your 20s, perhaps if you're the oldest child, the, tr the traditional good son or good daughter, this is something you need to hand over to Jesus. You can say, look, I'm going to honor and love and respect my parents, but Jesus here, you take this. I'm going to follow you even if I don't get the approval I've always had, or even if it means disapproval. Jeremiah shows us that faithfulness to God can mean conflict. But we have a great role model here. Here is someone who can help us as we disappoint or annoy our own family. <laughs> Remember verse 20, it says, To you I have committed my cause. Well, we come now to the third problem in our passage. Uh, there are three problems, as we saw. The, and the third problem here is that God seems to be taking too long to deal with people's covenant breaking. Have a look in chapter 12, verses 1 and 4. Wonderful. You are righteous, Lord, when I bring a case before you. Yet I would speak with you about your justice. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why do all the faithless live at ease? You have planted them. They've taken root. They grow and bear fruit. You're always on their lips, but far from their hearts. Yet you know me, Lord. You see me and test my thoughts about you. Drag them off like sheep to be butchered. Set them apart for the day of slaughter. How long will the land lie parched and the grass in every field be withered? Because those who live in it are wicked. The animals and birds have perished. Moreover, the people are saying he will not see what happens to us. See, here is a complaint from Jeremiah to God. And these verses, they're in the form of a psalm, really, just like you'd find in the book of Psalms. And Jeremiah's complaining to God. Why do people who ignore God seem to have such an easy life? Why does life go so well for those who pay no attention to God and who have broken the covenant as we saw before? You can see how he describes them in verse 2. God is always on their lips, but far from their hearts. Or in verse 4, the people are saying he will not see what happens to us. Jeremiah's got his own timeline for dealing with the world's problems and God is not meeting it. God is behind schedule. Do you ever feel like that? I think we can sympathize with Jeremiah here. Like the Bible keeps saying that ignoring God is a huge problem, but our friends and colleagues at work and school and uni just seem to be doing just fine. They've got nice homes, nice families, they've got good health. Will God ever do anything about people who don't care for him? Will he ever do anything about the evil in the world? Well, of course, God does have an answer in verses 5 to 13. And it's maybe more than Jeremiah was asking for. We'll just pick it up from verse 7. I will forsake my house and abandon my inheritance. I will give the one I love into the hands of her enemies. My inheritance has become to me like a lion in the forest. She roars at me, therefore I hate her. Has not my inheritance become to me like a speckled bird of prey that other birds of prey surround and attack? Go and gather all the wild beasts, bring them to devour. Many shepherds will ruin my vineyard and trample down my field. They will turn my pleasant field into a desolate wasteland. Now, God is saying that a time of judgment is coming. And it's not just a little tidy up of covenant breakers here and there. The whole nation will be obliterated. The many shepherds in verse 10 are foreign kings and they will invade and destroy the nation. It's kind of like the, the Hunter Valley with its vineyards and, and fruitfulness being turned into the Simpson Desert. Now, what this passage is particularly helpful for us, though, is it's really taking us into the heart of God and particularly the inner tension that God experiences in judgment as he waits. On the one hand, Judah is, according to God, the one I love. That's verse 7. God loves Judah. These people are precious to him. On the other hand, because of Judah's hostility to God, he says in verse 8, Therefore I hate her. God is hostile to his people. Love and hate side by side within two verses. We see the inner life of God. Now, is that how you think of God? Could Jeremiah here be expanding your thinking about God? Somehow God loves and hates his people at the same time. Now, within Jeremiah's lifetime, all this judgment did happen. The Babylonian army comes and destroys the nation. People are killed, buildings are knocked down and burnt. It's a ruin. 
But what we see in these verses ultimately, though, is a prophecy about Jesus. Because in Jesus, this tension of God's inner life comes together. At the cross, Jesus, the one God loves, was abandoned. He was given into the hands of his enemies, to use the language of Jeremiah 12, verse 7. Foreign rulers, in his case the Romans, destroyed him. At the cross, Jesus was bearing all the covenant curses spoken about in Jeremiah. Somehow the Son of God, whom the Father loves, bore all of God's hatred and hostility to sin and sinners. And therefore, it's only because of Jesus we can now have a relationship of peace with God, even though we have sinful hearts. And this passage in Jeremiah actually does end with hope. It's just a little foretaste of the gospel. We have a look in verse 14. This is what the Lord says. As for all my wicked neighbors who seize the inheritance I gave my people Israel, I will uproot them from their lands and I will uproot the people of Judah from among them. But after I uproot them, I will again have compassion and will bring each of them back to their own inheritance and their own country. And if they learn well the ways of my people and swear by my name, saying, as surely as the Lord lives, even as they once taught my people to swear by Baal, then they will be established among my people. But if any nation does not listen, I will completely uproot and destroy it, declares the Lord. God will have compassion on the remnants of his nation and plant them back in the land. But more than that, even the Gentile nations have hope here. Verse 16 is about Gentile nations learning the ways of the Jews and giving loyalty to God. People like us with no connection to Israel will be established as God's people. And later in Jeremiah, uh, in chapter 31, God will even speak about the new covenant to replace the broken one, which is a covenant of forgiveness and sins of sins and heart renewal. I'll just read from Jeremiah 31, 33 and 34. This is the new covenant. He's, it reads, This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. How good is that? The law in our hearts, forgiveness of sins, sins remembered no more. And the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that this new covenant was brought in by Jesus and it's open to us all. So Hebrews 9 verse 15 says, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. You want to know what deal we're in now, what covenant arrangement we're in now with uh, God? This is what it is, the new covenant mediated by Christ. Praise him. Well, we've seen today here in Jeremiah, there's a serious problem. There's covenant breakage. It's much more serious than a contract issue with a hotel. It's a serious breakage of an ancient covenant between God and his people. The people have been disloyal to God. But we've seen it's not just technical rule breaking, it's stubborn and sinful hearts, a problem of which we suffer as well. And God is holding off judgment, but the time is short. Do you remember those four things? He won't listen. The false gods won't save them. The time for prayer is over and the sacrifices won't work. And of course, we know that day of judgment did come. But for us now, as, a, uh, as outsiders, the Bible invites us to learn the ways of God's people and give our loyalty to him as part of the new covenant. Now, if this is not something you've done yet, I invite you today to give your loyalty to God. Submit to him as your Lord. Become one of his people. Find forgiveness and hope in Jesus. There are probably people praying for you, just like Jeremiah was praying for Jerusalem as long as God allowed. Don't leave it too late, for there will come a time when it will be too late. And you can send a message to that phone number after the talk or post on the comments, whatever you like. But if you have given your life to Jesus, well, praise God. You're part of the new covenant now. I think as Christians, we can take on board the comforts and challenges of this passage. We can commit our cause to God, even as we deal with conflicts with the world and conflicts with family, and just that struggle of waiting patiently for God's justice in the world. 
but we can be challenged today also not to allow the stubbornness of our own sinful hearts to continue. We can be challenged not to be Christians in appearance, uh, like 12 verse 2, uh, the Lord is always on their lips, but far from their hearts, but we can be new covenant people. God is our God. We are his people. Our sins are forgiven and we now live to please him. Let this be a day when we renew our loyalty to Lord Jesus and give God the rightful place in our hearts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we confess to you that our hearts are stubborn and full of sin. Thank you that Jesus took all the covenant curses and punishment for us. Thank you that he establishes a new covenant with us of forgiveness, peace and renewal. Jesus is our Lord. Help us to learn his ways and follow him. In Jesus' name. Amen.